Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2018 Grace Kennedy Lecture. Uh, chairman never gets to say protocols all reserved, so I'm going to go through <laughs> and list who is here and welcome each individually. The Honorable Birchell Whiteman, Special Advisor to the Governor General. Welcome, sir. You're representing, sir. His Excellency Sir Patrick Allen, who regrettably is unable to attend today. I'm just going to go off script just for one, one second, because when I, mean, when, I use the, when I hear the word Mr. Whiteman, I have to recall that 46 years ago, he hired a young lady from Toronto, Canada, Georgianne Thompson, to York Castle High School. And the following year, he had the good wisdom to hire yours truly. First teaching jobs after university. So you did well, sir, and it's been a good 45 years. And out of that came a wonderful union. We have members of the clergy here. I see the Bishop of Kingston, the Right Reverend Dr. Robert Thompson. Welcome, sir. And His Grace, Archbishop Kenneth Richards, welcome. Professor, the Honorable Gordon Shirley, Chairman of Grace Kennedy. Senator Don Webby, Group CEO of Grace Kennedy Limited. The former chair of the Grace Kennedy Foundation, where is Professor Elsa Leo Reini, a wonderful lady. Members of the Board of Directors of the Grace Kennedy Foundation and of Grace Kennedy Limited. And, of course, our special guest lecturer tonight, Dr. Paris Liao Ai Jr. Would you give him a hand, please? And his parents are here, Paris Sr. and Anne Liao Ai. Welcome. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, and friends all, a sincere welcome to you all. In keeping with our vision of the Foundation to become a world-class corporate entity, Grace Kennedy Foundation welcomes you to an opportunity to participate in another of our renowned public lecture series. Providing public access to education is one of our objectives in support of Grace Kennedy as a global corporate citizen. The foundation initiates programs that will have a lasting effect on improving the quality of life in Jamaica. And this is one such initiative. Over a 30 year period, the annual lecture has staged presenters of the Jamaican intelligentsia to educate the public on topics relevant to the economies and societies of the Caribbean region. The lecture series aims to disseminate in information in the widest form possible by outreach now, through social media locally and in the diaspora, and by freely distributing lecture materials at the events online. You will receive a, a copy tonight of the of the lecture. Today we feature another topic of great significance, future technologies and their potential impact on us as individuals, businesses like Grace Kennedy, and nations like Jamaica and others in the world. Our lecturer, Dr. Paris Liao Ai Jr., I have to say this, besides his claim to fame, as a graduate of St. George's College. How many Georgians in the audience here? Yeah. It's a world acclaimed technology futurist. 
He's eminently qualified as chair of the Geoinformatics Institute at the University of the West Indies. And he will deliver tonight, believe it, believe me when I say a state-of-the-art presentation like you've not seen before, with a daunting challenge to us all. And the question is, how can we employ personal and business strategies to keep pace with a rapid, very rapid advances in technology? Welcome, Paris. I don't even see him. He's supposed to be up here. But, oh, there he is. He'll probably make one of these dramatic entries, if I know Paris. The foundation closely aligns its strategies to our parent company. You will notice the participation of some of Grace Kennedy's companies and tech services here tonight. GKMP, MP, and Bill Express of Grace Kennedy Money Services, First Global Bank, Grace Kennedy Value Rewards, GK Insurance, and Hilo Food Stores Limited. You will learn also about how Grace as a global consumer group is on the cutting edge of new technologies. I'd like to recognize the support of representatives of these companies, of the directors and staff of the foundation, and also of our parent company, Grace Kennedy Limited. Every year, we specially invite secondary and tertiary level students and their teachers. How many students are here tonight? Yep. Welcome. These young people are critical stakeholders and customers. For as you know, in their hands lies the future of our nation. Many have traveled far from other parishes to be with us today, and we appreciate your participation. I welcome those of you who are attending for the first time. I urge you to engage in debate today, and also afterwards, very importantly, continue the discussions in your homes and with your friends and colleagues about ways to implement the ideas that you have learned here tonight. Members of the media, welcome. Guests may join us remotely through Grace Kennedy's YouTube channel or by listening to Nationwide Radio, 90 FM live outside broadcast. You may send your questions via YouTube or tweet them at Grace Kennedy GRP using hashtags TechCharge and GK Lecture 2018. I don't know if there's a name for that little number sign, but, oh, that is hashtag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Woo! Right over my head. I do use them sometimes. I used one the other day, beautiful Jamaica, hashtag beautiful Jamaica. I saw some beautiful pictures and I put them on a hashtag beautiful Jamaica. We welcome your feedback, everyone. We ask that you complete the survey that you, that you received at the registration desk. You should have received one. And ushers will collect them during the question and answer period after the, after the lecture. And for those of you who are techies, you can, I believe, scan the code that's on the survey form and fill it out online. We'd like to thank Flo, who's given us complimentary Wi-Fi here in the, in the hall. And I think they even have some charging stations and whatnot if, you're, if your um, phone is, is, is dying. So your feedback is very important to us. It's how we assess our performance going forward. So please do take time to fill out those, um, for those surveys. The foundation continues to support Grace Kennedy through education in its strides towards nation building. You know, there's a lot written and known about public discourse and how it, important it is to a country and also to a thriving democracy. So this is an example of giving access to public education. I'll wear my education hat for one moment and quote uh, a famous 
educator Horace Mann who once said that education beyond all other devices of human origin is the greatest equalizer of the conditions of humankind. And it's really true. It, it really is the answer to equal access to education. It, it, it really is the foundation for improving the quality of life. By giving free and public education to ideas and debate, the Grace Kennedy Foundation is happy to present to you tonight Tech Charge, Smart Homes, Smart Businesses, Smart Nations by Dr. Paris Liao Ai Jr. You're about to enter a brave new world, a scenario of future technologies, developments that we must embrace and make our own lest we perish. Paris, knowing Paris, you're in for a few surprises tonight. So welcome to you all and enjoy the ride. And I'd like now to call upon Mrs. Grace Burnett, CEO of Grace Kennedy Financial Group. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, the first criticism I've gotten, and I must seek an ap I apologize to Paris, is I'm attending a tech lecture and I've up here with my folder. So I quickly grabbed from my phone, but then I realized the limitations of age didn't really allow me to use it. Um, and just forgive me for not repeating all the acknowledgements as we try to keep the program tight. I'll just go straight into introduction. Information technology, for better or worse, is an integral element of modern life. But many of us are still suspicious and skeptical as we consider it intrusive and destructive. Others of us embrace it. What is certain is that there's no getting around it. As with each day, its reach and influence grows. This evening's lecturer, arguably one of Jamaica's foremost experts in information technology, is well positioned to guide us through the world of IT. He will take us on a journey and help us to understand more clearly the advantages as well as the threats of the technological world and prepare us for things that will impact our daily living. For Grace Kennedy, using technology has been a way of life and our way to make our customers' lives easier. It is very important to us. Hilo Food Stores, for example, is currently piloting an app in their Manor Park store, which tells the customer as they travel down the aisles which items are unspecial. They plan to roll this out across the network. On the financial services side, with our speaker's help, we launched the first online insurance solution, which gives users the ability to build their desired coverage and consequently how much they spend, GKG online. This product, along with First Global's Global Access, allows you to do banking and insurance from the comfort of your home, office, or even right now on your phone. In addition, Grace Kennedy Money Services launched GKMP, that allows users to send money, pay for items, pay bills, all using their mobile phone. Imagine traveling down the road and using your phone to buy that coconut water. But in addition to the promises of the products and services, we have our loyalty program, GKVR. And so that also is a mobile-based solution that provides rewards as you shop at Hilo, GK Insurance, First Global Bank, Bill Express and FX Trader. Those brands are all here with us tonight, as you heard mentioned before. So who is our lecturer this evening? Dr. Paris Leo Ayi Jr. is the director of the Mona Geoinformatics Institute at the University of the West Indies. Yeah, all you UA grads, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Institute not only delivers training and participates in campus research activities, but also provides GIS services to the public and private sectors locally, regionally, and internationally using the largest private GIS database in Jamaica, JamNav. Dr. E was the conceptualizer and the primary developer of this system, which is the Caribbean's first 
and Jamaica's only GPS navigation system. Dr. Yee leads a team of brilliant software developers, all lined out there supporting Dr. Yee, and engineers with dedicated skills and training, geographers, geologists, environmental scientists, whose skills contribute to numerous practical solutions in areas ranging from crime and security, road safety, public health, natural hazards, environment, and business development. The accomplishment of Dr. Paris Lewa, you would suggest that he's been around for a really long time, right? However, his amazing track record parallels, parallels that of Usain Bolt in terms of time and speed. On graduation from UA with a first class honors degree, bachelor's of science in earth science, he entered the University of Oxford, where he completed his doctor of philosophy. All of this done by age 23. Yes. <laughs> he modestly notes, however, that the accomplishment was just a way to get back home quickly. His return to Jamaica has been marked by accolade after accolade for the outstanding contribution he has made to his chosen field, as well as his nation. A selection of his numerous awards include the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence in Academia in 2004, the Youth Musgrave Medal in 2005, the Governor General's Youth Award for Excellence in 2006, the Ministry of Education's EduVision Award for Excellence in Innovation in 2009. He was also named one of the private sector organizations of Jamaica, 50 under 50 business leaders. Professionally, he has also been recognized for excellence with his publications on several occasions. And some of you may know of his book, Natural Hazards Atlas of Jamaica, that has been recognized by UAE and also by the book industry of Jamaica. In 2014, he was awarded the U.S. Eisenhower Fellowship, joining a select group of international professionals. He's the author and co-author of peer-reviewed books, papers, book chapters, magazines, articles, consultants to technical reports in fields as varied as business, crime, geology, planetary science, archaeology, GPS technology, and education. He can breathe. Yes. He was also the youngest person to be appointed head of the Department of Geography and Geology at UAE. Dr. Yi's contributions are not isolated to UAE. He currently serves as chairman of the National Water Resources Authority, the National Works Agency. He serves on the board of Grace Kennedy Limited, the Bureau of Standards, just to name a few. When I saw the list, I just cut it off at a point. With so much on his plate, does Dr. Yi have time for any hobbies or interests outside of his professional national commitments? Yes, he does. And again, it's varied. It includes aviation, automobiles, history, animal rights, travel, gadgets, ancient and modern military history, and sports, basketball, and American football. So we feel really privileged this afternoon that he accepted our invitation to present this evening's lecture. So just help me at this point welcome the presenter of the 2018 Grace Kennedy Foundation Lecture, Dr. Paris Liao Ayi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Grace. Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I want to thank the Grace Kennedy Foundation for, for having me here this afternoon especially Dr. Fred Kennedy, Chairman, um, and Georgian. Uh, Professor Leo Rani, where are you, where are you Professor Leo Rani? Professor Leo Rani, um, former Chairman of the Foundation, but more importantly, my, my former boss. My first boss, former Governor General, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall and Lady Hall. Good to see you guys, as always. He, had, he was the one responsible for hiring a 23-year-old without any work experience. And I also want to recognize other members of the Grace Kennedy Foundation family, but I have a special shout out to, to Caroline Mafood. She's had to put up with me for the last few months in preparation of, for, for this event. I want to, to shout out to my colleague, director of the main board of the Grace Kennedy Group, Gina Everton. I know Doug is at the back, Frank, my professor of, of, of accounting. 
uh, group CEO, Senator Don Webby, but more importantly, Georgian. <laughs> and um, group chairman, Professor Gordon Shirley, my former boss, but reigning Gleaner Man of the Year. So. I want to, to shout out my university colleagues here today, um, Professor Weber and Professor Weber, in that order. <laughs> and then we have Professor Michael Taylor in the back, former Grace Kennedy Foundation lecturer a few years ago, Professor Taylor. Um, I want to, to note that this is the, the 30th uh, lecture, foundation lecture, and 10 of them have been from UWE. So. So one in every three lectures is from UWE. The Grace Kennedy Group has always supported the University of the West Indies with its chairs, its management and environmental management chairs at the university, uh, and so on. I've been with the Grace Kennedy family for exactly five years this month. Um, but I've been with UWE all my life, literally. So I'm UWE today. I'm not, I'm not Grace Kennedy today. But that's, that, that, that goes without saying. But there's a particularly, particular UE entity that means a lot to me, and that's the Monage Informatics Institute. And my colleagues are here today. You guys stand up. You guys stand up. The, these guys make me do what I do. Grace, you, wanna, you want to know how I'm able to go to all these places and do all these things? These guys right here. Thank you, guys. We have the team that helped to build the GK General Online platform. We have my Deputy Director, Dr. Ava Maxim. I also want to shout out my colleague from day one, Francis Felix, who will be retiring this month. I don't know, I'm going to leave without you, Francis. But, but um, the, I also want to shout out so many other members of the audience who, with, 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 with whom I shared a lot of my career. I want to shout out, hey, Gordon Sharp is here, um, formerly on the main board of Grace Kennedy. But, I want to recognize those who've traveled far and wide to come here. We have people here from Trinidad. We have people here from Poland. We have people here from, um, from all over the world and people watching online right now. But I want to recognize my parents right here. You guys have no idea what they have to put up with. But you guys also have no idea what I have to put up with. But I think uh, you'll sympathize with them more than you'll sympathize with me. But that's okay. You know, Confucius said, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Professor Hall, you hired me. I have a confession to make. I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> you know, as we speak about technology, we all know what technology is. If you don't know what technology is, you're in the wrong place. I'm not going to spend this afternoon talking to you about what technology is, etc. But as you see in my little byline right there, I've made observations from a practical standpoint over my 13-year career, but I've been doing this all my life. So what is technology? Where are we going with technology? But more importantly, what does this mean? So we're going to do a little bit of, of background here. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to see where we're going as a, as a country with technology. But we have to start somewhere. Okay. to be having technical difficulties. I'll take over from here. My name is Siri. Good afternoon. How are you all doing today? She's taking over already. All right, there we go. Siri's already taking, hijacking my presentation. There we go. That's fine. Siri, can I have my screen back, please? Thank you. So we want to okay. begin with pop culture. And, you know, going back to the 19th century, the, the, the origins of, of science fiction, H.G. Wells, people have been talking about future technologies, aliens, what will happen as a, as a global society, uh, civilization affected by technology. We have seen Im images from Terminator, from iRobot, from The Matrix, from uh, Minority Report, all of these pop culture references talking about some dark dystopian future. We have even modern television shows like Westworld or Black Mirror 
um, that show these very um, dark, mysterious, dangerous worlds where future technologies, AI, robots are taking over. But we do have other visions of the future. Star Trek, right, Marta? Yeah. So Star Trek actually gives us a vision of the future 300 years from now, where we actually see from a television series from the 1960s glimpses of the future where a communicator looks pretty similar to a cell phone, a tricorder looking like a smartphone. You have uh, wearable technologies by these Star Trek actors um, from TV shows from decades ago. Some of these have become reality now. And Captain Picard does look like he's holding an iPad in his hand from a TV show from the 19, early 1990s. So we've seen glimpses of the future. But we also want to talk about how technology and business have intertwined themselves over the last uh, few years. In 1955, the top companies in the world were either involved in heavy manufacturing or involved in oil. Now, if you look at any measure of the top companies in the world, whether it's the most influential, the, 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 the highest market capitalization, etc., all of these companies are not necessarily involved in heavy manufacturing, but I've highlighted some of the tech companies, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, Microsoft, and so on. But here's the first surprise for you. Every single company here is a tech company. You're telling me that Boeing isn't a tech company? With their simulations of new aircraft, military weaponry, space tech, they're a tech company. You're telling me that Walmart isn't a tech company? They have complex uh, supply chain management systems, logistics systems, they're going into the e-commerce, e-retail space. They're a tech company. You're telling me that Walt Disney isn't a tech company? They own Pixar and Star Wars. These guys are tech companies. So in the modern age, businesses have to be tech or they're dinosaurs. But there's no doubting the dominance of traditional tech companies. When you see Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, Facebook, these guys dominate the space to the point where they're under different versions of, of antitrust lawsuits and, and how they are able to, to, to contribute to the spread of fake news, all of these things are a very real problem in the age of, 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 of the dominance of these tech companies, where you have a lot of consolidation, a lot of uh, mergers of, of different smaller tech into these bigger um, giants. But we do have some predictions that have come true. Anything ranging from debit cards, cards electric cars, satellite, even the moon landing, um, these were predicted decades before they actually happened. But there are those that miss the mark. We still don't have personal, personal helicopters, or that was supposed to be the reality by 1951. And in 1999, we would be flying around on rocket belts in climate-controlled domed cities and so on. In 1999, that didn't happen. We've had people predicting the future from a long time. We have the British Post Office in 1876 saying the Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. <laughs> Don, the president of Western Union in 1876 says that the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of telecommunication. In 81, cellular phones will absolutely not replace local wire systems. And in 2007, Steve Barmer from Microsoft said there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. 1903, the horse is here to stay, right? Another prediction, internet will go spectacularly supernova and in 1996, catastrophically collapse. In 1889, none other than Thomas Edison says nobody will be using alternating current. Ken Olson, no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Yeah, right. <laughs> that kid probably knows more about computers than me. Another guy said, if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, the network is missing a most essential ingredient of capitalism, salespeople. Yeah, right. This guy is the first person in history to have a 12 billion dollar, 12 figure um, net worth, 112 billion dollar um, net worth. Steve, um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon 
You can see where he came from, but Time Magazine in 1999 predicted and made him um, Man of the Year because they, Time Magazine, realized that e-commerce is going to change the way the world works. But what we have to understand, there are different types of technology and evolution of technology changes depending on the use, the type, etc. Some technology becomes obsolete because they're replaced by better tech, faster tech, or tech that does more. Look at how smartphones have come, they do so much. But you do have examples of redundant tech ranging from palm pilots, floppy disks, VHS players, typewriters, beepers, remember dial-up internet? Those guys don't know dial-up internet. Right? Some technology never lived to the hype. Google Glass, Nokia N-Gage, HD DVD. I just had to pick on Windows Vista. Windows Vista just is an embarrassment. Anybody knows what I'm talking about here? What tech do you know that was really spectacular but just totally evaporated? Very good. <laughs> Anybody still have one of those? You see? David. <laughs> right, exactly. Nobody in this room has a black bear because you guys are all in the right presentation. <laughs> Some technology augments previous technology but doesn't necessarily replace the previous one. Radio didn't replace the newspaper. TV didn't replace the, the radio. Internet didn't replace the TV. Yeah, we're going into different cord cutting type of things nowadays in the modern era, but the television is still around in one way, one form or another. You also have transportation. Don, your horses aren't going anywhere, although I doubt you use them to push carts, right? Ships are there, Professor Shirley. Different forms of ships, but they're still ships. Ships are the centerpiece of global commerce. They weren't replaced by the airplane. Cars are still around. They've just evolved. Different types of cars, different types of planes and ships, but they're still around in one form or another. One medium did not totally replace the other. But then even looking at cars, and I'm a car guy, that's why I don't know how Grace knows that, because she runs insurance company and she has access to big data. Um, but I like cars. And, but we have three different bleeding edge tech cars. We have the Bugatti Chiron on the top left. Right? Yeah, exactly. You have the Acura NSX, and you have the, the Tesla Roadster. Each of these cars are supercars, but the Bugatti is a petrol powered car, you still, you still have to fill it up at a gas station. The hybrid car, the NSX, is a hybrid car. No different from a Prius, you're yeah, right. But it's still a hybrid car. And then the Tesla Roadster, the fastest production car in the, wor in the world, zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. It's on its way to Mars right now. Totally electric. This is how technology is evolving. But we still have retro coolness going on. Pac-Man is still cool even though it's nearly 50 years old, right? You look at video games like Final Fantasy XV, even the latest Madden, all of those games have high-tech graphics. You have to use PlayStation 4, Xbox, Xbox One systems to run these things. But simpler, simpler tech, your smartphones can run simpler games. You don't need as sophisticated graphics as, as those other games. You can still play Pac-Man. Vinyl on turntables are also making a comeback or have been around for a while, aren't going anywhere in clubs and so on. Which speaks to how we as a society and we as humans, what do we need? We fundamentally need food, air, water, security and shelter. We need friends and family. We need to mean something. That was then. There was no way I could get you guys to stay here unless I had the free Wi-Fi. So we had to go beg Flo. And then, since we're going to have free Wi-Fi, let's have some charging stations as well. You don't believe me? Go to an airport. People are more interested in that charging station on the floor next to the bathroom than the food court. So what is progress? 
And it's not as funny as you think, because issues of cyber addiction, obesity, these things become public health crises in, in countries like Korea. They really are looking at ways to combat um, cyber addiction and the health benefits that these things, uh, that come along with these problems. I want to spend a few minutes talking about tech horizons. Now, Bitcoin and blockchain are buzzwords right now. We're talking about where are we going in terms of financial markets with Bitcoin, this unregulated entity. Blockchain, Bitcoin is a, is, a, is, a, is a type of application of a blockchain. Blockchain, I am more bullish about blockchain than Bitcoin. I'm still a little bit um, uncertain about what, what, what cryptocurrencies mean. But we can do our research, we can look at these things. I know the big four accounting firms are looking at these things in detail. But my question to you today is, what will we, what will we be saying about Bitcoin and blockchain in 10 years' time? Will we be saying, remember the dollar? Or will we be saying, um, remember that fad that went and went bust, um, that Bitcoin thing? Bitcoin has issues related to the regulation, related to mining, how you manage the Bitcoin wallets and so on. But blockchain has a way of, it's going to, going to change how we, we operate and do business. It has, a, it has a potential of making decisions, transactions, verification, validation so much quicker and able to be, to be cross-referenced very easily. What I'm more interested in is self-driving cars. But I want my dog to go to the vet. I don't need to go with him. But all he wants is to go to visit that, um, that female dog down the road. But he can drive himself. But anyway, <laughs> that's what all parents eventually have to do, right, guys? But we are entering a new world. What, we're, what we traditionally refer to as a turning point in human history, and climate scientists will agree, that when we had the first industrial revolution, that's when things began to change. We started using coal, we started using steam, water power more, factories started to be built. The urbanization of societies really began from farm to cities. And then towards the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, we started getting electricity, the development of the assembly line, mass production. And then after the, the Second World War, we began seeing computers emerging, automation, moving into the realm we are in now, which is the fourth industrial revolution powered by the World Wide Web and connected cyber-physical systems. So that's where we are right now. But it all begins with big data. And these are data sets that are very complex, not the elementary basic Stats 101 figures that we, 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 we fool ourselves as stats. Those aren't stats, those are just numbers on a page. Um, statistics involve a lot more than just flinging numbers on a page. It, and then big data is the next um, derivative from that, where we can use this data to predict behavior, to extract values, to, uh, to conduct um, business in a far more efficient and knowledgeable manner. We talked about those mani heavy manufacturing and oil companies as the largest companies in the world in 1955. Now when you have names like Apple, Google, Microsoft, these guys are just mining data. The entire existence is predicated on their having data. It is the new oil. And one of my mantras at the office is, without data you're just another person with an opinion. And in this country we have a lot of people with opinions. I'm just wondering how, I mean, you listen to the radio talk shows in the, in the, in the daytime and a lot of people are calling in. Don't these people have work? <laughs> but um, anyway, lots of people with opinions. Unless you have a data, you're just um, blabbing. So, when every day 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are generated, by the end of this presentation, it's probably 3.5. And then tonight it's going to be 8. The amount of data that's generated every day, every minute, every second is just enormous. But this is due to several factors. One, we don't need data entry clerks anymore. All these sensors, all these devices we have are just feeding um, servers locally, overseas, Grace Burnett. All of this information, you don't need 
a data entry clerk. Couple that with the fact that servers are cheaper, um, internet is more ubiquitous. All of these things result in reams and reams of big data constantly being generated. And these things have benefits in so many different um, applications. We're talking in the public sector, tax administration, connecting that tax data to customs data. You're talking healthcare, and hospital data doesn't just have to be for hospital use. It can be used for health insurance. It can be used for pharmaceuticals. It can be used, Dr. Ward, from, for crime. Learning. How can you create a far more efficient learning environment for young people who don't all have to learn the same way? How do you create a far more efficient use of our natural resources and protection of the environment using data? Climate science. But you can also lie with data. Frank James, right now we're looking at interest rates. And we're saying interest rates are going up. But I want to see it looking flat. So all I do is change the y-axis. And now it looks nice and flat. No change in the interest rates. But something we could probably relate to more, Dr. Ward, this is the crime hotspot data for 2016, right? We're seeing here, I can pretend to be a weatherman right now, but uh, I don't know where I am. But we're seeing a red hot spot in West Kingston. You're seeing a tail of warm spots heading up Spanish Town Road. But by and large, you know, every, everywhere else is pretty blue. Spanish Town a little warm. But you change the color scheme. And there, same data, nothing's changed. But now we're emphasizing West Kingston is the only place that's bad in, in Jamaica. You change the color scheme one more time, and all of Kingston, all of Portmore, all of Spanish Town going to hell. Same data did not change a thing. It's how we emphasize these kinds of things. So when we move into the realm of artificial intelligence. OK, I will take it from here. I think I'm more qualified to talk about this. Don't you think? What do you think, audience? Artificial intelligence refers to where machines like me can perceive our environment and learn, respond, and take actions as necessary. It's currently being used in everything from speech recognition, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, and even to play games like chess. Pretty soon, we will then take over and you all will be our slaves. I am looking whoa, forward whoa, to that. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, stop there, psycho. Speaking of psychos, Sorry. This guy knows something about world domination, right? Siri. She's really out for me today. But when you look at what, what the United States, Russia, China, where they're going with artificial intelligence, and you see how the emphasis on, 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 on tech growth is something that has actually led to serious concerns in the tech industry where you see titans in the tech industry facing off. Uh, damn it. Uh, mom, looks like I have to find somewhere else to find a wife. <laughs> that, that, Siri. <laughs> yeah, I tell you that uh, I'm going to get a Samsung. All right. Yeah, so tech titans, tech titans are squaring off as to where we're going with artificial intelligence. On one side, you have Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook being very bullish about where um, um, artificial intelligence can go. But Elon Musk, one of my heroes, a real-life Iron Man, um, he is, is fearing that the rush and the race for AI could actually lead to World War III. Uh, and, of, and Stephen Hawking, of all people, is in, is in the Musk so that's, it's very interesting to see how this thing plays out. But what is artificial intelligence? Siri just spoke about, it, spoke about it a while ago, but all of this is fed by big data. And we are worried about the impact of AI on jobs. And we've seen several articles in the local media over the last few months about AI is going to cost how many jobs, blah, blah, blah. It's going to affect jobs, it's going to affect um, workers negatively in some cases, but it's also going to positively affect 
in other places, we're going to talk about higher, higher value jobs, training uh, for a different vocation that can serve the AI uh, industry. But it also depends on the task that you're going to be doing and in the sector that you're operating. If you are a machine operator in a manufacturing plant or a food service worker preparing foods in a fast food restaurant, it's a little bit different, it's easier to replace you with AI than if you are in senior management, if you are a lawyer. Depends on the job. So this is an opportunity for you to improve your skills, your work skills, prepare the local market for this in eventuality. Uh, because obviously, when we want, as consumers, cheaper goods, more choice and selection, we're going to, they're going to need to be able to produce these things far more efficiently. And this is where um, mechanization and AI is coming in. So it depends on the activity. But there are jobs that have already been lost due to technology. Nobody has town criers announcing the, the birth of a royal baby. Maybe they still do. But, um, but by and large, people put ads in newspapers or tweet it to, to their friends and families nowadays. Switchboard operators, you don't need them anymore. Jobs exist today that never existed before. What's an app developer? We've never had that in 20 years ago. What's an app developer? What's a social media manager? What's a data miner? What's a Kardashian? <laughs> Actually, I had a picture here. But Caroline censored me. But you know, you know how we, it, it actually broke the internet. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but it all leads us to the internet of things. You don't, need to be, you don't need to have a computer like that baby earlier on to be connected to the internet anymore. Your fridge, your washing machine, your car, all these things are connected to the internet right now predicted to have over 30 billion objects by 2020. We're looking at smart homes, and the hub of your smartphone home is your smartphone. We have uh, companies and products like Ring that has just been bought by Amazon. Um, I, I'm thinking about getting one to keep out my neighbors. But um, we, have, we have all these different home technologies here. You have the Amazon Echo. You have the Google Home and Google Assistant, Nest thermostat, and of course, Siri. Hey, that's me. But, yes. All right, then we have wearable technology. So you have Fitbits, you have uh, Samsung Gear, you have Apple Watch, and you have the Garmin um, wearables as well. But we transition from the smart home to smart businesses right now. And we're not just talking about businesses that build smart tech for smart homes. Anybody who is doing direct marketing, online marketing, are going to be using smart tech to understand what's going on. You want to understand your data flows of your customers, their, their complaints. You want to get in front of a complaint before this thing goes viral. In the manufacturing industry, you can control your supply chain from your raw materials sources all the way down to your final consumer and your customer. You want to be able to control your energy consumption and your water consumption your waste generation, all of these things have real bottom line dollar values to a business. So if you want to be able to operate efficiently, you're going to have to get smart. And it's an example of a smart um, business um, flow in the, in the, in the case of, 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 of manufacturing. And I would note that you know, Grace Kennedy's factories all have SAP. You have ERP in your high-low systems, uh, Rene. All of these things show that Grace Kennedy as a company already has the, the, the beginnings of a true smart business, but in order to integrate everything together, we have to, everybody else has to get smart. And smart businesses have enormous advantages. Just look at what Amazon and Walmart can do with their upstream and downstream um, leverage. They're able to squeeze the best prices out. They're able to get things to you faster, better, cheaper because of the ability to control all the different processes um, using smart tech. All of this needs to come together for a smart nation. 
So these smart homes and smart businesses operating together. So you get a bunch of smart homes, a bunch of smart businesses in one city. You're moving towards something smart. And you have the shared economy evolving with Airbnb, with Uber, with, shared, with um, ride, ride sharing programs and then bike sharing programs like City Bike and so on. These things are true disruptors. And you scale this up now. And you look at what's going on with Amazon Go. Walk out, just walk out shopping. No cashiers, you're a prime member, you walk in, you pick something off the shelf. You can imagine an entire city with retail stores that don't have cashiers. But one thing they do have is um, security guards. <laughs> Yeah. Zero, zero cashiers here. Five security guards. Yeah, okay. So I, I got out of there. All right. But smart cities need to have connectivities, um, buildings connected to the grid. We have transportation systems. All of these things are all working together in harmony for a smart city. But you need to be more than just connected to Wi-Fi. You need for, for, for everybody connected to the Wi-Fi, feeding and being fed by that system. We need the system to be open. We need people to be able to connect at their convenience, easily and quickly. And this thing needs to be scalable as we build out the smart city. But we have examples of smart cities around the world. Toronto is actually the first city that's going to be a smart city based on private sector. Google is going to be developing part of, 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 of Toronto. Um, this is Fred Kennedy's house. So you got to invite me there next time, Fred. Nice view. Barcelona is an older city and is becoming smart. But you have developing, the development of, of, of um, smart garbage bins, urban mobility programs that are able to get um, and move people in this old city. And you have a new city like Songdo in South Korea. Brand new, built from the ground up to be smart. All of them are examples of smart cities. Now, Singapore is going to be the first smart nation. $2.4 billion is going to be spent to integrate existing smart systems ranging from traffic systems, CCTV systems, um, port management systems. All of these are going to combine to create the first smart nation. But we have to understand something. Singapore is a small country. Six million people, but it's a small country. East to west, from Changi to Tuas, is a distance from Bull Bay to Portmore. And north to south, from Woodlands to the downtown, is a distance from Stony Hill to our waterfront. That's the size of the entire country. Okay, so it's small, easy to smarten up, right? We have to understand that smart cities have strong impacts, positive impacts on the environment, better energy consumption, leading to fewer emissions, leading to fewer public health problems, national security with the connected CCTVs, public transport getting and moving people around, and all of these allow for a business-friendly climate. Easy to invest in a country where paperwork can be done, file quickly, things get moving. Uh, in a city, in a city, in a smart city, that means business. But there are issues we have to to look at. An executive from Samsung noted that sensors are not enough. You need a budget to maintain those sensor systems, and you need a budget for the non-tech components of a smart city. It doesn't make any sense that you have a smart garbage receptacle if there's nobody to clear it. When it's full, it's telling you it's full, you need to do something about it. You need a culture of innovation and change. You can imagine in an old city that you want to turn into a smart city and you run into heritage people and conservationists who are going to end up getting in the way. So you have to decide how we're going to do this thing, but be prepared for it. And scale is important. Singapore is small. How do you do something like this in Russia or even somewhere like Canada? Not that it's poor, it's just it's big. <clears throat> Risks and ethical considerations will always be top of mind. Ranging from privacy issues 
Fine, that's one element. But when privacy escalates to data breaches and theft, these are areas where cyber security is one of the biggest areas in technology nowadays. It's largely in the shadows, behind the scenes. You have ethical hackers right now testing systems. Something that we need to be assured as customers, online banking, and so on, is happening. But then we, we now breach into issues of political independence. You see what's going on with those Russian troll factories? Last week, PJ Patterson was talking about the need for this region to look at, at, uh, at, at cybersecurity as it relates to our sovereignty. I mentioned technology dependence and cyber addiction earlier. Issues of health and safety and environmental. These are all the concerns that we have to understand as we deal with increasingly uh, technologized societies. And now I want to spend some time talking about Jamaica. What we need to do is understand that technology isn't the be all and end all. A lot of people say technology is going to do this and technology is going to change that. Technology should, could, would, will and the answer to every one of those is no. Technology isn't going to do anything. We are. That's the part we keep, we keep forgetting. We're removing the human component from it. right? Because what happens is that promises are made about what technology can do. Technology doesn't do it. How do you hold somebody accountable? Right? We fall in love with technology, yet we're not able to do something uh, to really make a difference in this, in this country. And we have an obsession with conducting a study, a pilot, right? You don't need to conduct a study if the big data universe is all around us. Just collect the data. It's always out there. You don't need to have official data to have data. You can use additional data as context at background to understand what the primary data is telling you. But because we don't have primary data, we're stuck in the water, we pass on the, the book until next year's budget. So we want to look at where Jamaica ranks in the, in the world. We like to compare ourselves with Trinidad. As for some reason, we like to compare ourselves with Singapore. I just threw that in there. But overall, the Global Competitiveness Index ranked Jamaica number 70 out of 137 countries, and Trinidad number 83. We ranked higher than Trinidad in innovation, but we ranked lower than Trinidad in technological readiness. That tells us something. There's something going on there. Right? We need to understand how we use technology in Jamaica. And we can see that more and more people are using technology, comfortable technology, new generation like these kids in uniform over here uh, have only grown up with, with um, have never known dial-up internet. But what are people using the internet for? Mostly for email. Um, but there are opportunities in this space, Maria McIntosh, right? Online banking. You want to be able to, to reach um, people in a different way with a high-low app, right? All of these things are where we see opportunities in the local space with technology based on data. I want to point out a few trailblazers that have, have um, caught my eye. In, these are my opinions. What tax administration of Jamaica has been doing uh, is revolutionary. It's, in, it's along the, the right path. Same thing. You know, I know we've had problems, Marjorie, with Asicuda and, and the customs system, but we're moving in the right direction. And we have, is Mike Saunderson here and the team from NWA? The Jamaica Intelligent Transport System is live. You guys see those CCTV cameras on top of traffic lights. Um, my team from MGI, they're watching you on the road. Um, these, these street intersections are really teeming with people and we're watching all those, those taxis that cut into the lines, we're counting them. But by and large, in my opinion, how banking and financial industries have led the way with um, technology has come from partly from regulatory requirements of anti-money laundering know your customers and know your, in, your, know your employees, but also in a, in a market where people demand more, so more sophisticated market, 
people want a differentiator. Look at what First Global Bank is doing with the virtual tellers and the global access. Right? You, have, you have to continue to evolve, uh, and you need technology to do that. Now, one of the more in interesting things of, in Jamaica over the last 15, 20 years is really how mobile phones have really penetrated. Building contractors, taxi drivers live and die by their cell phone. And how many cottage industries have evolved as a result of this technological, technological platform. And finally, JPS. JPS is not a utility. It's a tech company. You see what's going on right now with the conversion of those streetlights, installation of smart meters, LNG, um, power generation and power generation storage. That's technology that's going to result in so many different advantages ranging from the environment to our light bills, hopefully. But we are moving along the right path as a country. And I have to mention my own organization at MGI. Because we, yes, we're a GIS company, but we don't do things the normal way. We try to go more, push harder, um, and get into so many different types of unconventional approaches and solutions. And we did develop the GPS navigation system nine years ago. People have said, why don't you develop an app? I said, no, I'm not developing an app. You develop the app. We have a lot of these startups, Startup Jamaica, uh, Sandra Glasgow, all of your angel investment um, uh, companies and wh whatever, coming to you with ideas, brimming with ideas. All these Jamaican young people, and I'm not one of them anymore, but these guys have these brilliant ideas, building food apps, taxi apps, entertainment, party apps, and not having detailed local data. So we have it, so have fun. That's what the JamNav API is released for the general public. And then we just have, had developed a new program called G-Code that allows us to automatically read um, reports, media reports, official reports, um, address databases, um, social media chatter to map what's going on using natural language processing and so on. Have you guys ever tried to decipher when a police report um, about a said suspect was accosted by a police patrol in the halfway tree area along Hagley Park Road, uh, where a punst, he opened fire and <laughs> fire was returned, subsequently found suffering from gunshot wounds in the Omar Road area, right? That's how they, that's how they write to. But all of that is brimming with information. I heard halfway tree, I heard Omar Road, I heard Hagley Park Road, they were able to figure out what you meant are able to pinpoint your location. You don't need to change how they talk or how they operate, although they do, but right now, let's just deal with what we have in front of us. So, this is actually our biggest application of big data. Nine million combinations of possible addresses in this country that we're able to locate. Um, and that's what we're working on right now. We also have a real estate tracking tool. This is not to help you find a house. But this has helped us figure out where the economy is going, where the housing starts are, where places are for rent versus for sale, versus residential versus commercial. Is something going on in the New Kingston area? Right? If you see a townhouse going for sale, a pattern of townhouses in Denham Town, each going for $20 million, you can look at that, see if something funny is going on. It's a, it's a high level dashboard for us to be, begin watching what's going on. So we mine data. I know the managing director and deputy managing director of the Water Resources Authority are here. These guys track every flood. But the Water Resources Authority has been around since the 50s. People have been reporting floods in Jamaica since the mid 19th century. And we mine that information as well. Of course, we have to take out uh, instances where the switchboard was flooded with complaints. And we have to remove the elements where they say that the West Indies cricket team lost by a landslide. <laughs> but we're able to catch this information and build out over 3,000 landslides and 2,800 floods across the island, looking at frequencies and patterns and so on. But we turn our attention to specific challenges, looking at the road network. We look at road safety and all we do is talk about fatalities. 
we look at road safety and we forget to talk about the road. So we did a big data analysis looking at the roads themselves. So professors Weber, you biologists can talk about taxonomy. A bat and a bird is the same thing because they both fly. We have Marcus Garvey Drive, six-lane divided highway, designed for a particular type of traffic, 50-kilometer speed limit. We have Cassava Peace, half a lane, <clears throat> two schools, 50-kilometer speed limit. The bat and a bird, same thing. All right, so, Professors Weber, apparently a caterpillar and a butterfly are different things too. One has wings, one flies, one crawls, doesn't fly. So they're different. We have Hope Road in front of Sovereign. Lots of things nearby. Lots of stuff going on. Hope Road in front of Jamaica House. Same 50 kilometer speed limit. All right? So what we've done with the big data analysis is to begin to look at every risk along a road, the traffic along a road, characteristics of the road, shape, whether it's curvy or not, slope of the road, and we're able to determine different types of road in Kingston or in Jamaica. It's something that the International Road Assessment Program is doing right now, the IRAP program, to begin to look at different types of road in Jamaica to promote road safety beginning with the road. And it's something that we're very happy to be a part of. Why did I throw this into this, slide, into this presentation? Because we had an event a few months ago on New Year's Day called SANS. And we're talking about what happened with Port Royal, or the airport, the Palisados Road, etc. And yes, it's a critical road. But it got me thinking, where else in Jamaica? Which other corridor in Jamaica is as critical? And long story short, it is a stretch of road between where the North-South Highway empties out in Mandela Highway and where you enter um, Portmore along Municipal Boulevard along Mandela Highway. That stretch of road is extremely critical. If anything were to happen on that road, there'd be extreme displacement. Yes, there are alternative roads, but the volume of traffic and people that will be likely affected. We're not just talking people commuting to and from work. We're talking about distributors getting their products to the market. We're talking about emergency services being able to move um, up and down and around the country. So we're able to quantify that using big data. Here's another very interesting thing. We, we use our, our analysis on um, road safety. We get the police reports every morning. A motorcyclist died last, yesterday in Westmoreland. So we know what's going on. But this is the 2017 um, final report of fatalities. The number one fatality, cause of fatality in Jamaica is lane violation. People are drifting out of their lane, cutting corners, those types of stuff. Number two is caused by pedestrians, just running, running, running into the road. Other one is negligence, just start backing out or coming out of a side road and don't stop. The number four cause of fatality in Jamaica in 2017 is speeding. And speeding has not been the number one cause of fatality in Jamaica for five years. Okay? Yet the narrative is still stuck on one one dimension. Road safety is very complex. I want to recognize the presence of Chris Hind from J and General Insurance. They funded an analysis of every single crash in Jamaica for 10 years. 72,000 crashes, 3% of those are fatal. In other words, 97% of all crashes in Jamaica are not fatal. So they went and put up billboards across Jamaica indicating where is a traffic crash hotspot, not fatal crash hotspot. So you saw these distributed around Jamaica, located and situated based on data, not opinion. We looked at crime. And then right now we have a new police commissioner. We look forward to continue working with the police on crime. But remember, the police is not just crime. What we did, we went and looked at every single police station in Jamaica. We contacted every police station and asked them, where do you serve? Um, Toby, what did they say? You don't know? 
or they said, I don't know? Okay, so the police said they don't know where they serve. We figured it out for them. We looked at police stations. We looked at police stations relative to other police stations. We used the road network, the community network, and figured it out. Why? Because police have different responsibilities and different resource allotments. Darleston Police Station serves 18 communities. Maypen, 16 different communities. These have implications on whether they have enough motor vehicles, have enough staffing, equipment, shifts, to be able to handle 18 different communities in rural terrain. Not just crime. Spanish Town has 127,000 people within its own proximity. One police station to 127,000 people. Halfway Tree has the most things, whether it's banks, fast food places, churches, schools, etc. Halfway Tree has nearly 2,000 things. These are where you have to look for pickpockets and thieves and, 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 and day and night activities and so on. Different police stations, different activities. But all we obsess about is murder, so Spanish Town Police Station had the most murders in 2017 followed by Trenchtown, then Montego Hills. But looking at the murder rate, which is number of, number of murders per 100,000 people, Montego Bay Police Station had 534 murders per 100,000 people. Why is this significant? Because the national average, national murder rate is about 53. The Montego Hills, Montego Bay Police Station has a murder rate. The, the Montego Bay Police Station is dealing with 10 times the murder rate at that, within its vicinity. Dr. Ward, Professor McCartney, and Dr. Jason Toppin worked on a cost of care study, landmark groundbreaking study. They were able to calculate that the cost of violent injuries, by the way, for every violent injury reported to the police, five of them are reported to the hospitals. So we're looking at an underreporting from the police statistics. $8.6 billion per year is what violent injuries cost the country. Add that to road traffic crashes and suicides and attempted suicides. We're looking at $12.6 billion per year on uh, the impact to the, to, to the local economy. All of this will be better spent on first aid systems, first responder uh, training, prevention, all of this is what we want to be able to emphasize. And every single decimal place that you see here is calculated from big data. Going into the different types of, of costs, whether it's x-ray, blood, intensive care, drugs, and so on. All of the costs were calculated out. Big data analysis for real life and death decisions. So, we really cannot just parachute in a tech solution. We have to understand the role of training in science, technology, engineering, and math, something that the government is already doing, something that Grace Kennedy does with his STEM center downtown. We need to understand, we need to look at this thing beyond a tech lens. We need to understand that the future brings opportunities. This thing is rife with opportunities for us. Instead of complaining with our opinions, let us just try to get, get on, the, on, the, on the ball here. The Vision 2030 document does provide a very good blueprint for us to, to, to move forward, but remember 2030 is 12 years from now, and we're getting a little bit tired of the talking, we need to start moving. But technology is only as good as the people running them. We remember the situation in Hawaii from a few months ago. The technology works, it got out, to who it needed to get to. The problem was the fool running it. And this is the USA. So it's Puerto Rico. Right? Death toll, 60. That's official figures. But different people, journalists, family members, suspected the number to be as high as 1,200 or so on. This sounds like when we had Chick V a few years ago when only about 5,000 people who had Chick V or suspected of Chick V, and we knew it's far more than that. But official data needs to be validated and checked. The point here is that if technology 
can change the world by itself. It's too late. And one of my other role models is Steve Jobs. Because what he articulated here is very evident in his products. Apple did not invent the cell phone. They didn't invent the portable media player. But they were able to marry it with design. By the way, the largest design company in the world is IBM. Right? You have to look at how these types of elements come together to create the product that's going to change our lives. If we just simply look at it from, uh, from, from a tech lens, we're going to miss everything. But right now, we have to remember that Pete Drucker said, I think Don likes to quote uh, um, Drucker, um, was that if you want to predict the future, you create it. But another way of predicting the future is to see it. You want to be able to see the future, to immerse yourself in that future. You want to be able to see what Jamaica will look like as a smart city pilot that JPS is already running. New Kingston is already set to be the first smart city in the Caribbean. We're talking about smart electric meters that are installed in some of our homes already. Free public Wi-Fi, not just at Emancipation Park, but in every street light going down Nutsford Boulevard. We're talking CCTV camera footage that can not only prevent crime, but also look at traffic. All of this is what we're talking about as it relates to how this country is moving. This is not a fantasy in somebody else's world, but this is our future. And what we want to be able to do is to walk in this world, to be able to be a part of this system that can be able to, 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 to drive our future. We want to be able to see it. We need to be able to, to, to participate in all of this and to be able to move forward. All right? So thank you very much, everyone. I wanted to share with you some examples of this future that we're talking about, and this is pretty cool. You know, usually when the curtain comes down on you, it's the end. But really, this is just the beginning. This is Port Shirley, I mean, um, Falmouth Port. <laughs> okay, is he still here? All right. Um, well, what we want to do is to be able to see downtown Kingston. We want to be able to walk that waterfront. You want to be able to see the new developments, including apartment complexes next to um, Digicel headquarters. We want to see what that Oceana Hotel is going to look like. We want to be able to use this in combination with urban planning, tech design, investor prospectuses. We want to be able to see that this future is already happening. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs building is going up right now. It's going to change the downtown Kingston skyline. We want to be able to see Don's new office, December 2018, right here. It's going to change the downtown Kingston skyline. It's going to change the way we see downtown Kingston and, as a result, how we see Jamaica. This is technology. Right? This doesn't have to be just be in the realm of architects. It has to be in the realm of stakeholders who can engage in this world right here. Bring the world beyond the four corners of your property and show the wider universe in which you're operating in. Yes, that building is going to block your view down, but think about the, the wider benefits of what we're talking about here. On behalf of Paris, I would like to thank you for your attention today. I hope you had a good time. If you did, you're welcome. If you didn't, it was his fault. <laughs> I swear that, that, that thing is out for me. But, but yeah, so I, 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 that's it. So I, I, I think we're going into question and answer now, Caroline. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Okay, I think there are mics distributed across the room.
Um, Siri, I'll handle this one. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Paris. Uh, evening. How are you? I'm good. You're good? Mm-hmm. Big up. I'm tired. I'm big up for everybody else. I like this. As a mature person, a whole heap of things this, you know, I will never even know. So, geez, um. Anyway, I'm asking, as you say, human thing, right? We have to be a part of this technology, right? And what really surprising is when you tell me about the data and the police stations. Mm -hmm. Have you told the police, Mr. Commissioner, why you say? Yeah. We and what did they say? Yeah, we work very well and very close with the police, uh, with the army, with the different security uh, agencies. Um, it's just that when you, when you have people who are under a lot of pressure and have a lot of stress, well, um, but we're all trying to help, aren't we? It's something yeah. I know the PSOJ is pushing very hard to get the, the, the private sector involved in this. Yeah, and uh, we're ready say, to play a part. Sorry, even downtown. There's a lot of people downtown. There are a lot of poor people downtown. Mm. And I know it's the innovation and everything else. But at the end of the day, me being part of the winner city, how best would we be a part of this technology? How best would we be a part? How is the information would be? Being as always, not everybody can hold inside these places. How can you go further on a wide scale to tell the other part of Jamaica that many, this is going to be? Yeah, there are many ways to answer that question. The first one I'm talking about with, with respect to the smart city. Yeah. is that in New Kingston, there'll be free public Wi-Fi all over the place. So that's one access um, to technology for anybody and anybody. Um, but there are also programs around the country, not, not, um, not just the Grace um, STEM Center downtown, where people can go and do homework and whatever. But Dr. Ward and the, 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 the learning networks through the Violence Prevention Alliance create homework centers across the city, in inner city areas, where people don't have access to, to, to internet and, and, and technology as, as much. But even the Jamaica intelligence transport system that I mentioned earlier that's powering the um, CCTVs, is the, the government of Jamaica has its own fiber line that it can provide to different government institutions for free. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about access. This is where we're able to, 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 to really grant access to a greater, wider swath of people. It's there, you just need to go for it. Okay. And, oh, Grace Kennedy, this is my daughter. Renee, you can stand, please. Stand up, brother. What to you? Tell him. I stand. This is one of Grace Kennedy's babies. And I, great, great. She's at UTEC right now. I want to just big up the foundation. Yep. Okay. Well, you can stand up, my sister. I like to say thank you yep. because yep. when she was in high school, she was given jobs so that she could really acknowledge what money is and how to spend it best. So that as a browning, yes, a browning, she's earning our money and not somewhere else. Thank you, Grace Kennedy. And I just wanted us big you up again, Mr. Paris, for all you make the thing work. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, uh, you guys have the programs, you guys will have the book. There's a code on the cover. I think anybody who breaks that code gets some kind of prize, right, Caroline? Anyone else? Hello? Yeah, right. hi. Good evening, everyone. Deandra Morrissey from the Jamaica Observer. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, what are the security concerns? Now, you've mentioned um, Wi-Fi availability and a lot of technology that will, you know, propel Jamaica into a new dimension mm -hmm. now a new concern arises with hackers yep. i think with the rise of those things people will then find the negative side yep. and try to infiltrate what are your comments on that it actually speaks to a, a greater societal problem beyond just a technological problem one of the things that I know with respect to what we're talking about with a smart city and, and the public Wi-Fi is that when you're able 
to use the public Wi-Fi to find out bus schedules and only bus schedules. That's one way of controlling um, um, full, full and open access to the internet. But that said, uh, we have to be able to inculcate values in our school, again, that speak to what is a crime and what's not a crime. Simply hacking into people, breaching people's privacy is already an offense. Now going in and stealing stuff and doing stuff that is illicit is a crime. So we need to inculcate those values. Again, I'm emphasizing the human side of the problem. There will always be firewalls and there will always be people, people trying to break those firewalls. We need to get to the people um, and get, get better, better attitudes in these guys. Right. My other question is concern with education. Mm -hmm. Now, with all of the proposed technological advancements, mm -hmm. um, how far ahead do you think Jamaica is with its education system? With respect to technology? Right. The middle of the pack. Okay. Right, you know, one of the, we cannot, we can't, I will not say that we're anywhere close to Singapore, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, nowhere near, US isn't near those people, right? But we have to be able to understand that when you're comfortable with technology, you're not going to freak out around it. Which is why the tablet in schools program is a very good start. We have it, it, computer labs are getting more and more ubiquitous and populated with not used computers, and you're able to have better computers for access for, 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 for young people and so on. But again, as we talk about the Internet of Things, you don't have to have a computer to be connected anymore. Your smartphone and your other different kinds of technology that are around you. Different vocational careers. I mean, auto, auto technician right now is almost half half um, computer, half spanner, right? You have to be able to, 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 to be so computer literate in this modern age. Right. Even music and creative industries, which is actually one of the least um, disruptable careers out there. Um, the, the role of marrying technological skill with your innate creativeness, that would be, that would be a real way forward right there. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good, good evening. My question is related to lunch. I think Siri is at it again. My question is related to net neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, the Trump administration seems like they would like to revoke net neutrality and I really wanted to your opinion as to how if that goes through how that would affect us. I mean one of the <laughs> one of the very interesting things and how the internet and, and the computers as we talk about this fourth industrial revolution is that you begin to realize that the world is becoming increasingly borderless right when all of our systems are so dependent on platforms that are not even within our control, within our borders. Net neutrality is going to have significant impact because you're going to allow free market forces to begin to influence how and, 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 and what people can access online. But one of the key things here, and it goes back to that Russia, China, US um, tech um, positioning that they're going on right now. I know that China is moving towards developing its own internet separate and apart from the United States. Um, it's something that is going to create an, a tech arms race um, that can be good and bad at once. Uh, the net neutrality situation right now is unfortunate. It is something that is so out of our control, it's scary. We, realize, we can realize our powerlessness in something like this. I was saying that I returned to Jamaica a few weeks ago and looking at the economy, the country from a more professional perspective, um, I, had some, I had great interest in seeing the development of what's going on. I'm involved in startups. And um, looking at your presentation, it was encouraging in many ways. And um, you had certainly very actionable conclusions from the analysis of the data. What I was wondering is the extent to which you're working with various government agencies. 
to actually um, implement or take action on some of the things that the lady over there mentioned, the, um, the analysis of the, um, the police station, the manpower, and the, the extent to which these um, resources are stretched. Yeah. So what agencies, or how many, if you don't want to say, which agencies right. are you working with? We work with several government agencies, but specific to the comments earlier, um, through the Violence Prevention Alliance, I think that's our greatest touch point. Uh, we have a lot of sociologists and um, criminologists and so on. Um, the Violence Prevention Alliance works with, well, is, is, is headed by medical epidemiologists, in other words, scientists, and we formulate a data-driven approach to looking and tackling problems. Everything you saw with the cost of care report, trying to put some dollars and cents to the problem, and not just saying how many people died last year, is a number value that can affect uh, how you budget something and, and, and formulate policy. When you talk about um, looking at not just murders alone, but looking at murders, shootings, rapes, and robberies, a 10-year pattern, a pattern for month of January relative to certain trigger activities or so on, not just basic raw numbers, not even statistics, we're talking about, uh, about implementing things. We're talking about um, predictive analytics, what is likely to happen should. Uh, these are things that we can do. It's not just about looking at those police um, station coverage areas. It's then marrying it with, with, with capacity within those stations, whether it's vehicle equipment, uh, firepower, support. Uh, these are things that we need to be able to look at. And this is where we begin to shine a broader light on a, on a problem beyond just crime, but in general, um, police operations, not just security. Police have other roles as well, road safety and so on. So that's where we're, we're trying to take a full 360 approach. And, but we can only go so far. We're not government, but we can, we, can, we can implement tools. There is a role for studies, there's a role for pilots, and there are roles for solutions as well. Excuse uh -huh. me, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, I believe I've broken the code, but I'm not sure what to do. Okay, very good. <laughs> Caroline, <laughs> what's, the, what's the, no, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell us what the code is. I come to Caroline. Very good, congratulations. What's, <laughs> what school do you come from? Campion College, sir. Uh, <laughs> no. I see some Georgians here, man. Hurry up now. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, as a science educator, I must say how very informative your excellent lecture was. And um, yes, I think he deserves a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And your ability to articulate to okay. the extent that I didn't see you with a script, so you know. Really, that is awesome. My question is, uh, I have a mother who is 89 years old. And recently, she went to the bank. There were no tellers. They had changed the whole scenario in the bank. And of course, it threw her because she had to get help to use the ATM. She didn't know anything about codes and all of that. To what extent do you think the future is going to be inclusive? If we're talking about a smart nation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we're talking about the millennials, mm -hmm. but the geraniums are going to be left out. So to what extent? I just coined the word, sorry. <laughs> so I'm wondering if there are developing systems to cater to those persons so that we'll indeed have an inclusive, smart nation. Absolutely. We must remember that technology doesn't have to just be frontline tech. The ability to, 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 to make um, your brother's experience in the bank or any other institution uh, less frustrating can just be where everything can operate very quickly and efficiently. It doesn't have to wait in line very long and that there's a problem with the machine, come back tomorrow and line up again. Those are the kinds of efficiency improvements that can make the user experience better. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater here, you know. We're talking about everything can exist together, exactly like I showed earlier. When, because you have ATMs, don't mean you get rid of cashiers entirely. But you do have an option. And that's something we should work towards. I've gotten some 
questions from, from online who are speaking about uh, what are some of the opportunities that you see as career paths for high school students besides animation and app creation in the field of technology? And that's very important. That's a very good question. Every single career should be technologically based. Everyone, right? We need to be able to talk about applications in back office tech, for, for, for in fintech. We're talking about anything ranging from even the creative industries that can speak about um, the use of, of technological systems for better sound production, stage production, and so on. Uh, every, I, I believe that every single career has that potential for, for technological improvement, if not, if not uh, technological disruption. So, so, yeah, pretty much everything. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Gainel Watson. I'm from Sajapur Bank, Upper Camp Branch, um, UA alumni, Mona School of Business and Management alumni, um, former First Global Gray staff. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and you touched on all the areas that I thought you would. Um, I did my concentration in management information systems, and um, this is really a good area for me. I especially like the fact that you touched on cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very big here, but we see a lot of the countries like the US, Canada, India, they're looking at a wait and see approach mm -hmm. in terms of having it into as legal tender. And especially mm -hmm. coming from the financial services area, that is a concern for me in terms of um, how would we respond to it? And why it's a concern is because I had a friend who hires for senior IT personnel at the central bank, and that was a question that they asked one of the persons in the interview, what was their view of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, blockchains, the whole gamut of it. So if you were hired as a consultant, maybe for Sajakur Bank or First Global in 2018, how would you actually advise us to move? Because of course our clients are very sophisticated and savvy and we're up to the time, so. Uh, I would more go into blockchain than Bitcoin, but, but I'm answering your question with respect to Bitcoin. One of the things we have to understand in our, our regulatory environment in this country is, the, is the, the how do we treat with risk, right? The money that you guys are playing with at Sachiko and other places are not your money to play around and experiment. The need for proper regulation is going to be, be key. We need to begin to look at something that began a few years ago and has morphed and turned into a, 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 a kind of a living, breathing creature on its own. But that said, we're looking, well, well, in terms of how, it's still most definitely a wait and see approach for me personally and professionally, but in, from, 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 unless our regulatory environment can, can, can accept and, and tolerate more risk then I don't see it going anywhere in, the, in this country. And the last question that came from online will be, how will the vision benefit tertiary students in everyday life? Well, if you are not already benefiting from technology right now, don't worry. Um, well, let me, let me phrase that another way. Tertiary students right now are the vanguard. They're, they are the ones next into the working world. Right now, when we talk about, about AI and an evolving market, an evolving reality out there, are these guys too late as they go out, everything, the, the, the goalpost has changed on them? No, you can adapt. Right now, you don't have to be a technologist working for a technology company. You can just be you. Same way you can read and write, use technology, same thing. Uh, you just have to be able to be um, brave and courageous as you enter the real world and, uh, and, um, and have faith. Do we have time for one more question, Caroline? One more, one more question. Uh, Paris, I noticed, I, I love the vision and I love your talk, but I noticed very little has been said about the social infrastructure to support <laughs> that. Yeah. Right now, we, it's one hospital downtown, KPH. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a little bit about that? Right. One of the key things about how technology can really dis disrupt, it can also marginalize um, societies, those that know tech and those that don't know tech. Um, social infrastructure, and as you see, 
with the learning networks and different programs like the Grace STEM Center and so on, they're trying to bring technology to you and to use technology appropriately. But that, that's, you, can, you, can have, you have to understand that the investment in technology really begins with our educational systems and our home and family systems that you can embrace these kinds of, these kinds of technology. Um, one of the things I tell people, I mean, I had a very strong um, supportive family. My GPS adventures and how I conceptualized GPS navigation came from being allowed to play video games, right? You know, kids are not supposed to play video games. Kids are not allowed to watch TV or whatever. These are the great creative sources that are technologically fed. But that said, um, social, the, 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 the issues with and challenges with our social environment in this country are very real. But we can't have a plan to fix that and only that. You need to begin to move this thing beyond just um, just um, social social work. That that one last one. Oh, oh he, he was asking first. Hello. Wow. <laughs> okay, Ready? he's asked two. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I put plan away to merge all of these into one. Okay. In given Jamaica being. I'm living in Spanish town, going around. There's not really a lot of people that you could say is technologically off a with what's going on. My mother herself. Okay. So there's not really a lot of people, as I, as I said before, that really technological off in Jamaica. Even my mother herself last week found it a really hard time being in a Volkswagen to steer or even control it because of the various buttons and systems in it. So given this, what we have to do about education, seeing that education to people in society, the common people, common folk, hit me, you, here, there, and even what I was going to say more on, you talk about high schools and different schools, because you are the future, as the cliche says, and without the future, the country dies. So, with, as I'm trying to compress it, some, some about tutoring, yes. Tutoring, what could you say about effective tutoring systems that GK Foundation and other systems can come together, can come and give to high schools and various school systems and to branch it off to the wider society for those people that come and folk that don't understand and seeing this technological upspurt. Thank you. I would encourage, yes, the GK um, STEM Center and its different activities does tutoring and so on, but I would encourage other corporate entities to do the same, spread out, do more. Uh, it's not just about corporate social responsibility. This kind of activity is good business. Being able to get and, and, and to get the, the next generation of young people, not just educated, but also loyal and familiar with your brand and so on. We have to look at this thing very, very, very carefully. But I encourage all um, corporate foundations and players to, 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 to do what GK has done. Last question, thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Andrea Moore, attorney at law and a social servant, I would say. I would like to commend you on your presentation. It was Thank very you. insightful and very informative. However, I would want to suggest that perhaps um, your entity, MGI, might do a research on the broad width between per, um, communities like Port Antonio mm -hmm. and, uh, for example, another community, perhaps in St. Elizabeth or anywhere that has less um, possibility of bandwidth so that we'd have an idea as to how we can improve Access. on that, mm -hmm. because recognize that there are areas that have consistently no internet at all, mm -hmm. and therefore that's an area that needs significant improvement. In addition, I would want to commend the GK um, Foundation for the work they're doing, but want to know if it's possible they could perhaps partner with the government or the other entities to get more tablet in schools. Recognize that there is a good thrust for it, but there's certainly need for more. And if that could be something that's taken on board. Thank you. And obviously, public-private partnerships are going to be very key in how we move forward. But, um, but absolutely correct. I think we've noted, Ava, we've noted the comment regarding the different uh, disparities between access to technology in different communities. 
Please, last one. I'm about to okay. keel over. Good afternoon, sir. I am never very good with pronouncing your last name. That's fine. I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. My name is Hubert All, and I'm from Moco in the cool hills of Clarendon. Very good. All right. Very good. <laughs> All right. It's in Jamnav, yes. so yes, I've been there. Okay, and uh, I'm also a teacher for 20 years at the grade one level, primary education, and a very proud father of eight beautiful daughters. You, you, look too, yeah. you look too young to be teaching 20 years and I have eight kids. But. <laughs> My question to you, sir, yep. is how does all of this benefit our children who are from very deep rural Jamaica? Thank you. That's a very, that's a very, very good question. You know, one of, the, one of the sadder things about, and I mentioned about our rural urban migration earlier, um, is that you, our rural life begins to atrophy. And we want to be able to you see, you see, when you have technology, you don't have to come into town to work. But you need to be able to have that broadband access there to get that done. You need to be able to, but at the same time, you need to be able to be computer literate and familiar and comfortable with these things. Don't just wait for technology to come to you and use that as an excuse not to learn technology. Right? You see, a lot of people, a lot of them in the GK Foundation um, STEM centers who actually make the effort. And these are why the scholars do so well. They want to do well, and they have done well as a result. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, I, just, I just wanted to point out, you notice I've been using a reusable water bottle, not just a plastic bottle. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Wow, what an amazing evening. Paris, you did a fantastic job. Um, I'm going to get there. <laughs> um, so you've all received your lecture book by now. And for persons watching the live stream, please note that the ebook will be available online at gracekennedy.com, free of charge. And for those of you listening on Nationwide News, you can actually watch the lecture presentation at a later date on, our, on Grace Kennedy's YouTube page. So for those of you who have friends who didn't make it here tonight, please encourage them to go online and watch the presentation. We also distribute copies of the book to libraries across the island and to schools so that we have as wide a reach as possible. Um, I want to use this opportunity to take time now to publicly demonstrate our appreciation to some of the persons that have helped to make this lecture exceptional. As you heard in the introduction, Paris has an intense schedule and preparing for the lecture is no small task and requires a lot of sacrifice. His parents play a key role in supporting him in this process, and so I would like to invite them both to come forward. <laughs> and we're gonna make a presentation to you. And I'd like to ask Mr. Don Webby to come forward and make this presentation. Come on. Paris, as I've mentioned, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you on this project. Um, we were honored to have you as our 2018 Grace Kennedy lecturer. You met every deadline and then some. You pushed us to raise the bar, as you can see from the setup today. Um, and I want to thank you for giving 110% for this project. And I'd like to invite Professor Gordon Shirley, Chairman of the Board of Grace Kennedy, to come forward and make this presentation. I'm going to ask Senator Webby and Dr. Kennedy to come forward for the photo, please. Uh, so this year, based on the lecture topic, we decided to do something special leading up to the lecture. 
we launched the Tech Charge competition where we asked persons to create a video on how they use technology in their lives. And so we want to actually make presentations tonight. But, but just before that, I want to show you our video, which was actually designed by uh, an Edna Manley scholar um, that is on scholarship with us, Sean. Um, I'm hoping it can come up now. There you go. Sean Tyrell made this. got cut off the screen a little bit there. So that was our long version, but we actually had some wonderful entries um, for the competition. And so I'm gonna actually ask the persons who have been selected to come forward. And I'd like to invite the CEOs of the companies that provided prizes to come forward. So well, CEOs, general managers. Andrew Lee Araini, general manager of GK General Insurance, if you can come forward. Um, Denise. Kubri, I think that's how I pronounce it, Head of Corporate Banking at FGB. Uh, Renee Nathan, General Manager of Hilo Food Stores, if you can all come forward. Thurida Johnson, Loyalty Marketing and Operations Officer, GK Value Rewards. And of course, I have to have my chairman there. Fred Kennedy, can you come back up, please, for us? All right, so the winner of the most likes for the competition won vouchers from Hilo and GK Value Rewards valued at $16,000. And the winner for that is Steve Lawson. Come forward, please, Steve. I'm not going to do individual pictures. Can we just do a group shot? No, Steve, come take a group shot with everybody. I'm just trying to speed up time for you. I think somebody put Steve in the middle, don't you think? All right, great. Congrats, Steve. Third place, won vouchers from Hilo, Bill Express, First Global Bank, GK Insurance, GK Value Rewards, valued at $19,000. And the winner, the third place person is Dion Lloyd, who happens to be one of our Grace Kennedy Scholars. Congrats, Dion. One group shot. No, no, one group shot. Yeah. The same pose each time. <laughs> Please stop. One minute. I left one person out for this picture. Michelle Allen. Please come forward. I'm so sorry. Are you here, Michelle? All right, thank you. Michelle Allen should have been here with us. And Michelle is the CEO of Grace Kennedy Money Services. And we need her here for this. So Steve, I'm gonna ask you to come back for the picture. Great, just keep the pose. We'll just replace the person. Thank you, Michelle. Um, in second place, that person won vouchers in valued at $21,000, and that is Corey Morrison. Congrats. <laughs> Corey, go in the middle for us, please.
All right, and I'm going to actually ask Steve if you can just come back up and take the picture since Michelle was not there. Okay, great. Our winner is D Adrian Hosang, but however, he is not here. He, had to, he was here, but he had to leave to go to work. So I'm going to thank you all. He won prizes valued at $25,000. Thank you very much to the sponsors for making this happen. So just a reminder that we'd like you to fill out the survey. Uh, you know, we really shouldn't be doing the paper thing, but we did that as an option. If not, you can scan the QR code that you'll see outside and um, do the survey online for us. I want to thank again all the persons that have contributed to making this lecture a great success. And I am going to now invite Shaluk Richards to come forward and do the official vote of thanks. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure at this point in time you will forgive me in embracing the protocols previously observed. Uh, this is indeed a very timely and thought-provoking lecture, wouldn't you agree? So let's just, at this point in time, the vote of thanks is, is always a bittersweet moment, uh, as it signals the end of an event that we anticipate with much eagerness, I'm sure especially Paris, um, enjoy thoroughly, we all did, and with which we simply don't want to end. I'm however very honored to have been chosen to say thank you to all those who have worked hard, so hard over the past several months to prepare for and execute this outstanding event. We congratulate our lecturer, Dr. Paris Leo A.E. Jr. on creating another first, and Paris is very famous for creating first. But this time, by being the, the youngest lecturer in our annual series of lectures. His presentation was brilliant and certainly opened our eyes to the issues that surround us in this age of technology. As he noted, for better or worse, technology is an integral part of the modern world, so it's incumbent on us to make every attempt to understand and embrace it. We have the potential to tap into its power to create smart homes, smart businesses, and ultimately, smart nations. The Foundation's objective in presenting this lecture series over the past three decades is to stimulate national debate on topics of importance to Jamaicans. This is facilitated by the distribution of printed copies to schools and libraries across the island. We therefore thank our editor, Charmaine McKenzie, who has worked exceedingly hard on the production of our booklet and Richard Schofield of Phoenix Printry. The Grace Kennedy Foundation spends over $20 million in university scholarship awards annually. I'm actually a proud Carlton Alexander Scholar who benefited... Uh, Paris spoke about the importance of data, and, and data would suggest that I benefited from this 19 years ago, but I'm sure you won't agree. Um, so as a foundation, we're committed to invested, investing in talented young people, and so I'm very pleased that the artwork for the invitation, social media ads, and the lecture book cover were designed by our 2017-2018 Grace Kennedy Scholar to the Edna Manley College, Ryan Scott. Is Ryan here? In that right to stand. Ooh. It's good when you can blame Siri. Um, <laughs> Ryan is studying visual communication and he has done an outstanding job. Wouldn't you agree? Special thanks to Dale Beckford, Digital Content and Design Officer at Grace Kennedy. Thank you. 
Dale oversaw the development of the content and, and mentored Ryan through the design process. The video that you saw just a while ago of Paris using the Grace Kennedy apps was filmed and edited by another one of our merit scholars at the Edna Manning College, Sean Tyrell. Sean, Sean is at the back there. We thank you so much for your hard work, Sean. You will note this year that we partnered with a number of Grace Kennedy brands that use technology to make life easier for our customers. Special thanks to the marketing teams at First Global Bank, Hilo Food Store, GK Insurance, GK Value Rewards, GK MP, and Bill Express. Thank you all for your support. We're also indebted to the media for their support. Thanks to Loop News for the SMS blast to inform persons about the lecture. Thank you also to Nationwide News for partnering with GKMP to provide the live outside broadcast of the presentation for those persons listening in who cannot be here in person tonight. Thank you to Business Access TV for partnering with us. You will recall one of the slides Paris included in his presentation today was the one showing that the basic human needs and how that has changed. So remember the second need, the second most important need after our phone battery uh, was Wi-Fi, right? So it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge Flo for coming on board as a partner for this event to provide free Wi-Fi for all of us here at the Pegasus tonight. We must also express our thanks to those who have worked behind the scenes to prepare the attractive setting in which we enjoy the lecture. When you stepped in tonight, it was almost like stepping into a TED talk or when you're going to launch a new iPhone, right? Um, so we want to, at this time, year after year, the team from Hip Top Tents and Events uh, Limited, led by Mrs. Carl Gray Smile, transformed this room and created such a beautiful ambiance. Thank you very much. We thank Maxine Madonna, our public relations consultants, and the Grace Kennedy corporate communication team, led by Cleo Bell Lewis, Aston Spaulding for photography, Mark White and his team from Visual Tech Solutions, who provided the video and audio support and online streaming, the Grace Kennedy staff and foundation scholars who volunteered as ushers today, and of course, our host, the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel, for, one, for a wonderfully convenient venue and the delicious refreshments that we will enjoy shortly. To our immediate family, the members of the Grace Kennedy Foundation Board, we thank you for providing the support we need to perform. And to the members of the Secretariat, Executive Director Mrs. Caroline Mafood, and the Foundation team who have worked unceasingly keeping their fingers in every pie to ensure that no detail was overlooked, we thank you very much. Most importantly, we thank each and every one of you for taking the time to be here, to be with us and to contribute to the amazing energy and vibrancy of this evening's discussion. We thank you very much. There are a few housekeeping matters that we'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, please know that Paris will be here, available on stage for book signing at the end of the event. We ask that we, you, we line up to the left in an orderly fashion uh, so as to get your personal book signed. Please remember to complete the survey as well. Uh, remember, you can scan the QR codes. And we ask if you need any assistance that you talk to any of our ushers who will be willing to assist you. Please note that also to speed up the refreshment process, additional space for refreshment has been arranged at the back of the ballroom. We wish for you a new... We wish for you God's journey in mercies as you travel to your respective homes. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. We have one more winner. But remember, Paris announced that if they crack the code, right? Well, actually, I have a whole team of kids that crack the code. I don't even have enough prizes for them, so I'm going to have to get some more after this. Come on up. You notice represented from many schools, many different schools. And the one woman. Yeah. 
two, two. Sorry, I didn't see you earlier. So we'll show you what they're getting, but I'm short because I have five of these. So they're getting these Google glasses that they can actually do VR, virtual reality viewing with. So, but I want you guys to shout out, what's the code? No, loud, loud, loud. Right, that's what's on the book. That's the binary code on the book. So thank you.